welcome back. And today we're gonna to take a look at my brand new Litton Electronic Business Systems mini computer. I am beyond excited about this machine because, well, it's, well, it looks kind of like a washing machine if we're being honest. It does have that washing machine vibe to it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some really epic stuff going on with this machine and it has a connection to something very important and dear to me. So I want to get into that. But first of all, how do you even come across one of these? They're pretty rare machines. There's not even very many pictures of them out on the internet and it's certainly not something that you would just stumble across. Except that's exactly what happened to Kevin. Uh, Kevin is the man behind techselect.com. Uh, he runs it with his wife and they are a lovely couple. I got to spend a day hanging out with them. And uh, well, first of all, if you're not shopping at techselect.com, you're doing it wrong. Kevin is doing unbelievably good work for the retro computing community. And he's one of the smartest people that I've had the pleasure of sitting down and chatting with. So Kevin, if you're watching, thank you so much for entertaining me the other day. I had a blast just uh, chatting with you. But uh, Kevin at techselect.com reached out and said that he had this old Litton machine and he wasn't quite sure what to do with it because, well, it is incomplete. It is missing the uh, uh, teletype that goes with it, as well as the paper tape reader and punch. And Kevin had also seen that I'd recently gotten my hands on a ton of PDP-11 kit from Mitch down in Houston. So he said, maybe we can barter out a trade. And as soon as I saw the machine, I said, whatever you want, I will absolutely trade it for this machine. Because, well, first of all, this is a mini computer that was designed in the 1960s, uh, although we think this one was sold and built in 1971, maybe 1972. But this machine has an incredible connection to Centurion mini computers. Uh, but before we get into that full story, I want to get this machine into the room next to the Centurion, which means we need to uh, give it a little bit of a clean first. And then we also have to do some rearranging of the room in there to make space for it. And once it's next to the Centurion, I'll sit down and tell you one of the coolest stories I've heard in a while. All right, let's get to work. The little Litton here cleaned up beautifully, and uh, I think I cleaned up all right as well. I'm gonna miss the beard, but 
going to be back in a few days. The little litten though is where it's going to be. I've got it on furniture sliders, which means I can uh, push it in and it slides underneath this shelf perfectly. There's like a sheet of paper width of uh, clearance. It's almost like I planned it. Total coincidence, but it's right here where it's going to live because it's going to stay really close to the Centurion here because there is a link between these two systems. But in order to understand that link, we have to understand a bit more about the hardware of the Litten here. So what is it? Is it an 8-bit machine? Is it a 16-bit machine? Is it uh, maybe an insane 32-bit machine? And no, it's, it's, it's actually a 1-bit machine. Well, and it's an 8-bit machine. And it's a 40-bit machine. <laughs> it's a little bit of everything. <laughs> at its heart, at its core, it is a 1-bit machine. It's a bit serial machine. It works very similar to the vacuum tube computer that we're building. It brings in one bit at a time, does arithmetic on that, has a carry register that has one bit to carry that carry over to cascading uh, operations, and then it stores the result in an accumulating register. Now that accumulating register is 40 bits wide. That also corresponds to the very special memory that's in it, which I think maybe you guys caught a glimpse of. It has a rotating drum memory, and that drum uses 40-bit words. So it's a 40-bit machine, but it does operations one bit at a time. Now, whenever it has to communicate with the outside world, whether that be to the uh, teletype, which I believe is a Litton 1252, or to the paper tape reader or paper tape punch, it does that eight bits at a time. So it has an eight bit buffer register specifically for that. So it is a one bit, eight bit and 40 bit machine. Although the one bit portion of it, we can kind of ignore. We don't really need to think about that. That's kind of like the black box part of it. So really it's a 40 bit machine. It does everything on 40 bit word lengths. And uh, the reason that I think Litton chose a 40-bit word length is because that allows them to store an 11-digit decimal number plus a sign bit in a single word. And that is a huge number, particularly if we're talking about accounting, which is kind of what this machine was aimed at, small to medium-sized CPAs. And so if, you, if you're a CPA and you have a customer that has an account that has more than 11 digits in it, it's time to upgrade your business to a bigger computer. But uh, what this was aimed for, that would work perfectly. So it works on 40-bit word lengths. And that is wild. Having such a huge word length with a bit serial architecture is very reminiscent of old vacuum tube computers like the IBM 604. And this thing architecturally is very similar. It's actually much closer to something like the IBM 604 than it is to something like the Centurion. Now, I wanna show you guys what that hardware looks like. So let's slide this out, pull the sides off of it. And I wanna give you guys a close up look of the boards and the rotating drum unit. And there we go. These are all of the main computer boards. They're on a kind of a vertical rotation here on the bottom that allow them to fold out. And then over here we have the IO board and it's on its own little rotating thing that allows it to swing out and get access to it. Yeah. Now to get one of these boards out, you just push these two little white pieces in and then the whole board rotates down like that. And that is gorgeous. <laughs> the boards are extremely sparse. This one just has a handful of transistors and maybe uh, 15 ICs on it for a board that's massive. Uh, now, the scary part of all of these boards is, well, I mean, the ICs are kind of old and getting hard to find, but these connectors back here are the most terrifying part. There are ribbon cable connectors that go between each board and connect them all together. Instead of having a backplane, it's this is the backplane. And that is terrifying because those can go bad and cause all sorts of problems. So that's gonna require a lot of work. So we'll get the next board down. That was board A, this is board B. Uh, and again, you can see that the uh, ribbon cables here are starting to delaminate. Um, that is not great. 
So I don't particularly know what to do about that other than just hope that they stay connected. But again, you can see it's still a very sparse board here. And then if we go up here to board C, we're sticking with the sparse theme. And finally, board D is actually a little shorter than the rest but it will swing right on down like this as well. And that is all of the major PC boards that make up the computer. Now board D here obviously is the drum control board or has something to do with the drum memory because we can see it has all sorts of wires coming off of it here that go over to the drum memory. Now to get a better look at that drum memory, let's pop the uh, panel off of the other side and we can really get up close on it. And here is the party piece. This uh, AC cable here is actually unrelated. That's just an hour meter in the front. But this thing looks like a miniature nuclear reactor. It is absolutely beautiful. It, it's also wild to see one in person. It's actually belt driven. We can see the uh, electric motor here. It's just an AC motor and it drives the uh, spindle of this thing to spin it up to an insane 12,000 RPM. This thing is gonna sound wild when it's running. It's actually on little rubber isolators to make sure that it's completely smooth. Now the way it is split up is there are 32 tracks. Each track has its own dedicated read write head and each track is split up into 128 sectors and each sector has one 40-bit word in it. So if you do all the math of uh, 40 bits times 128 uh, sectors times 32 tracks, you come out to about uh, 20K of memory. So this thing has 20 kilobytes of memory, which is pretty amazing for the late 60s, especially considering that other computers that were using core memory were often running with like 4K of memory. So you have a ton of working RAM in here, and then you can store mass storage on paper tape. But, oh man, this thing is just absolutely gorgeous, and I am so excited to hear this thing spin up for the first time. <laughs> So I said there's a link between this Litton machine and this Centurion mini computer, but from an architecture and design standpoint, there's very little in common between these two. As a matter of fact, the Litton is much, much closer to things like the IBM 604 or the LGP30, which are uh, vacuum tube computers. It has more in common with those than it does with this machine. So where is that link coming from? Well, this machine was designed in the late 1960s and went on sale in the late 60s and into the early 70s. As a matter of fact, I think this particular machine was built in like 71 or 72. But around that time, 71, 72, Litton decided we're kind of done with the mini computer industry and they started to dial back their operations. That left a lot of customers, particularly in the Dallas area, high and dry. And this was where John Rex Warren and Bud Smith swooped in to save the day. They started providing uh, technical support and programming support for these Litton machines. And they built up a good rapport with ex Litton customers, providing support, building that relationship. And finally, at about 1972, 1973, uh, those Litton customers were going, hey, these machines are starting to get old and we hate paper tape. Can you build us a new computer? So Bud Smith went on the hunt and he hunted down the uh, Eldorado Electrodata EE200 from a company out in California. And then he went and sold a fake system to CDC to get some Hawk drives and they built the first CPU4 system. So hardware wise, totally, completely unrelated. But while Bud was hunting down all of the hardware, John Warren got to work writing the new operating system. Now this operating system had to be really special because it had to be random access and it had to work with an insane 10 megabytes of data storage that you get on the Hawk drive. But these systems were being built for ex Litton customers that had a huge amount of, well, their customer data stored on paper tape. And this Litton machine uses a 40-bit word length. 40 bits is weird. That's 
five bytes, which is not divisible by the standard sector sizes that we think of. Standard sector size would be something like 512 bytes per sector, but 512 divided by five is not evenly divisible. So if they were to build this machine with a 512 byte sector on the Hawk drive, they would end up with wasted space at the end of the sector, or they would end up with a word trying to span across two sectors. That just wasn't gonna work. It had to be backwards compatible with the data from the Litten machine. So if you build your sectors at 400 bytes per sector, that is evenly divisible by a 40-bit word or a 5-bit word. That means that in one sector on the Hawk drive, they can store 80 words from a Litten. And that is why the Centurion has such a weird sector size on the Hawk drive. It's using 400 bytes per sector because that was what was compatible with this machine. That means that all of the paper tape that Kevin hooked me up with that came with this machine, there's a good chance that some of it is formatted in such a way that we can read it into and store it on the Centurion and maybe even open it in the general ledger application on here. That is where the link is between these two machines. Not only that, it goes one step further because this machine would not exist if this machine hadn't existed. If the customers had been using something else, like say Data General or DEC or whatever was available in the early 1970s, they may not have ever had the problem of their company pulling out and being left high and dry, and John Warren and Bud Smith may have gone down a different path. But because those customers had Litton machines and because Litton pulled out of the industry at that exact right timing, the Centurion came into existence. We have the full history of Centurion sitting right here in front of us. And this one works, so we gotta get this one working. And we gotta start pulling data off of those paper tapes to see what it is, see if we can maybe copy it over to here and see if we can open it up in the general ledger. There's, oh man, the story is so cool and it just keeps getting cooler. This machine is epic. I am so excited about this machine because of that link, but also because it's such a unique, weird machine. And it has a rotating drum in it. How cool is that? So we've got a lot of work to do, and I hope you guys are as excited about this machine as I am, because we're going to get it up and going. Obviously not today, but <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work to get this thing going. But I fully expect it to work. We got to hunt down a new teletype for it. We got to hunt down a paper tape uh, reader and a paper tape punch. Although Kevin did hook me up with a paper tape reader and uh, I think it needs a little bit of work. It does have a fried ROM in it. So if anybody is familiar with that type of paper tape reader and you have a copy of the ROM, let me know so we can get that paper tape reader up and going because that could potentially get us up and going to get data onto this machine or data onto this machine. So, whew, we have a really exciting future ahead of us in the Centurion world. So, I hope you guys stick around for what's coming up because it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.